Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Wednesday night service at Grace Community Church. Thank you all for being here if you're here in person, and thank you for watching if you're tuning in online. If this is your first time watching or your first time here in person, uh, my name is Wade, and it's, I'm glad you're here, and I'm glad you're watching. Uh, let me go ahead and open us up in a word of prayer, and we'll get into tonight's message. Father, thank you for the message you gave me this week. Uh, I just pray, Lord, that you'd help me to present it. And Lord, I just pray for all of us that you'd help us to clear our minds and open our hearts to receive what you have to say. And uh, Lord, I just pray that you help us to just be present in the moment and uh, just set aside all of our worries and cares and just think about you right now and uh, not be focused on other things. Lord, I pray for all those that are sick that can't be here in person. I just pray that you'd bless them right where they are and let them know that you're with them. And uh, Lord, I just pray that you just take them Take control of this message, Lord. Let none of my opinions or my thoughts come out. I pray that everything that's said comes straight from you. And it's in Jesus Christ's holy name we do pray. Amen. All right. Well, if you were here last week, uh, last week's message was called communion. And uh, not the communion that we all think about when we hear the word communion. You know, I told you last week wasn't talking about the Lord's Supper where we, you know, eat the bread and drink the cup that represents the Lord's body and his blood. But uh, we talked about communion, you know, the act of really communing with God and communing with each other. And, uh, you know, I'll repeat that definition for you. Uh, communion actually means the sharing or exchanging of intimate thoughts and feelings, especially when the exchange is on a mental or a spiritual level. And how we talked about, you know, when we stop communing with God that way, when we stop sharing our intimate thoughts and our feelings with God, <clears throat> that's how we wind up in a season where we start feeling hopeless and depressed and overwhelmed, and we just feel separated from God. We feel pressed down, you know, things that are normally easy for us begin to be a struggle. And uh, so that's what we talked about last week. You know, it's important to stay in communion with God in prayer and through his word and uh, through fellowship so we don't wind up going through a season like that. And, uh, you know, that's not just important. I think it's vital to stay in communion with God and his people or we'll wind up uh, drifting away from God and his people, and that's when we wind up in the season we talked about last week. Uh, if you would like to see that message, it's... You know, it's on Facebook or it's on YouTube. But tonight's message, it goes right along with that. You know, I'll share a couple of verses that we looked at last week, but we'll go into a little more detail on them. Uh, and those verses were in the book of Joshua. One of our examples last week about people that had stopped communing with God and did, did drift away from him was Achan. Uh, if you remember us talking about him and I shared a few verses with you last week, but this week I want to share with you the whole story of Achan. Uh, and just to give you a little backstory before we read this, you know, this is where they were, they were just getting ready to go in and destroy Jericho. Jericho was the first town in the promised land, or the first city, that God told them to go in and destroy. And uh, because it was the first city, uh, God said, everything in that city belongs to me. You know, he wanted to keep the spoils to bring into his house, all the gold and the silver and stuff. And he told them, all that stuff, if it's not committed to me and you decide to keep those things for yourself, will be accursed. And if you take any of those things, then you're going to bring a curse upon yourself and upon the whole nation of Israel. And uh, we read that in Joshua chapter 6 and verse 18. Uh, I'll share that verse with you. Like I said all the time, I don't want you to take my word for things. I want you to see them in God's word for yourself or take notes or whatever so you can look at it later. But in Joshua 6, 18, this is where Joshua tells him that. He says, do not take any of the things set apart for destruction or you yourselves will be completely destroyed and you will bring trouble on the camp of Israel. So, uh, like I said, he told him, if you keep any of that stuff, you're not just cursing yourself, you're going to bring the curse upon Israel. 
So that's what I want to read to you tonight is the story of what happened when one of those guys did keep some of that stuff. But uh, I'll go ahead and read that. In Joshua chapter 7, is, it gives us that story. It says, But Israel violated the instructions about the things set apart for the Lord. A man named Achan had stolen some of these dedicated things, so the Lord was very angry with the Israelites. Uh, nobody knew Achan took that stuff. You know, he hid it. He didn't have any of the, or none of the other people knew. And Achan was the son of Carmi, a descendant of Zimri, son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah. And Joshua sent some of his men from Jericho to spy out the town of Ai, east of Bethel, near Beth Avon. When they returned, they told Joshua, there's no need for all of us to go up there. It won't take more than two or 3,000 men to attack Ai, since there are so few of them. Don't make all of our people struggle to go up there. So approximately 3,000 warriors were sent, but they were soundly defeated. The men of Ai chased the Israelites from the town gate as far as the quarries, and they killed about 36 who were retreating down the slope. The Israelites were paralyzed with fear at this turn of events, and their courage melted away. Joshua and the elders of Israel tore their clothing in dismay, threw dust on their heads, and bowed face down to the ground before the ark of the Lord until evening. Then Joshua cried out, O oh, sovereign Lord, why did you bring, up, bring us across the Jordan River if you're going to let the Amorites kill us, if only we had been content to stay on the other side? Lord, what can I say now that Israel has fled from its enemies? For when the Canaanites and all the other people living in the land hear about it, they will surround us and wipe our name off the face of the earth. And then what will happen to the honor of your great name? But the Lord said to Joshua, Get up. Why are you lying on your face like this? He said, Israel has sinned and broken my covenant. They have stolen some of the things that I commanded must be set apart for me. And they have not only stolen them, but they have lied about it and hidden the things among their own belongings. This is why the Israelites are running from their enemies in defeat. For now Israel itself has been set apart for destruction. I will not remain with you any longer unless you destroy the things among you that were set apart for destruction. Get up, command the people to purify themselves in preparation for tomorrow. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Hidden among you, O Israel, are things set apart for the Lord. You will never defeat your enemies until you remove these things from among you. In the morning, you must present yourselves by tribes, and the Lord will point out the tribe to which the guilty man belongs. That tribe must come forward with its clans, and the Lord will point out the guilty clan. That clan will then come forward, and the Lord will point out the guilty family. And finally, each member of the guilty family must come forward one by one. The one who has stolen what was set apart for destruction will himself be burned with fire, along with everything that he has, for he has broken the covenant of the Lord and has done a horrible thing in Israel. Early the next morning, Joshua brought the tribes of Israel before the Lord, and the tribe of Judah was singled out. Then the clans of Judah came forward, and the clan of Zerah was singled out. Then the families of Zerah came forward, and the family of Zimri was singled out. Every member of Zimri's family was brought forward person by person, and Achan was singled out. Then Joshua said to Achan, My son, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, by telling the truth. Make your confession and tell me what you have done. Don't hide it from me. Achan replied, It is true. I have sinned against the Lord, God of Israel. Among the plunder, I saw a beautiful robe from Babylon, 200 silver coins, and a bar of gold weighing more than a pound. I wanted them so much that I took them, and they are hidden in the ground beneath my tent, with the silver buried deeper than the rest. So Joshua sent some of the men to make a search. And they ran to the tent and found the stolen goods hidden there, just as Achan had said, with the silver buried beneath the rest. So they took the things from the tent and brought them to Joshua and all the Israelites. 
Then they laid them on the ground in the presence of the Lord. Then Joshua and all the Israelites took Achan, the silver, the robe, the bar of gold, his sons, daughters, his cattle, donkeys, sheep, goats, his tent, and everything he had, and they brought them to the valley of Achor. Then Joshua said to Achan, Why have you brought trouble on us? The Lord will now bring trouble on you. And all the Israelites stoned Achan and his family and burned their bodies. They piled a great heap of stones over Achan, which remains to this day. That is why the place has been called the Valley of Trouble ever since. So the Lord was no longer angry. That's pretty harsh if you think about it. I mean, I've been thinking about that all week. That stuck in my head. I mean, can you imagine what a day that was? It wasn't like Achan was a stranger that just came in out of nowhere and did something really bad and that was worthy of the death penalty. Uh, you know, those people were his family. We just read where they called him tribe by tribe and clan by clan and family from family and then on down to individual family. So, you know, those people were his family. Those were his friends. They knew him, and they knew his, they knew his wife. <clears throat> they knew his children. You know, I, like I said, I've been thinking about that all, all week. I bet that was a, a really quiet day in Israel. You know, I was picturing something like, like that happening in my family, how hard that would be to do. You know, I can imagine them all standing around, <clears throat> trying to decide who's going to throw the first stone because the Bible said that all of Israel stoned him and his family. Uh, and I think they did it that way. You know, everybody stoned him so that that responsibility didn't fall on just one person or one group because if it did, then, you know, maybe people would hate that person for the rest of their life because they're the ones that killed that family or that group or whatever. But with the whole nation doing it, you know, then the whole nation would bear that weight. But I think they did that that way so that uh, just one person or one group wouldn't be the ones bearing the weight of putting that family to death. But uh, I don't know. Like I said, I've been thinking about that all week. You know, would you be able to cast the first stone if that was your family? Or, you know, if that was <coughs> your son? You know, his mom and dad were there. Uh, you know, if it was your daughter, what about their husbands and wives? You knew them too, and their children. I, to me, that would just be a an unimaginable thing to have to do. You know, then the Bible says they had to burn them. Uh, you know, then again, who's gonna who's gonna light the fire? That would have just been a a very horrible day and not only them but all their animals and all their stuff and then they piled a great heap of stones on them and it, you know it said it's still there today so from then on every time somebody from the whole nation of Israel walked by there they'd remember that day and uh, <coughs> they'd remember that they'd see that big heap of stones and they'd remember that horrible day and uh you know, thank God we don't have to carry out the wrath of God today like they had to back then. But we can warn people who are heading for destruction like this, that are heard, heading towards the wrath of God. You know, we have the power through Christ. We can tell them, hey, you don't need to go that way. It's going to destroy you. You know, back then they, it was on us. It was on God's people to carry out God's command, carry out his wrath. But, you know, we're saved by grace through Jesus Christ. We can actually, instead of carrying out the wrath of God to destroy somebody, we can offer them Jesus to save them from that destruction, save them from wrath instead of having to be the ones to carry it out. And God gave us that amazing power. And uh, it amazes me how much we don't use it. Like I said, we can tell them you don't have to be destroyed. You and your family, you can be saved. Uh, 
And I'd, I'd say it's safe to say that nobody here, I don't think any of you guys, uh, if you knew somebody in your family was heading for that kind of destruction, that you wouldn't warn them. But uh, the Bible says that that's exactly what they're headed for if they haven't made Jesus Christ their Lord. You know, we can't make the choice for them, but it's our duty to tell them about it if we're followers of Christ. You know, we read that definition of communion a minute ago. Uh, if you're a born-again believer, your most intimate thoughts and feelings should include caring whether or not somebody knows about the gospel, whether they know the truth about Jesus Christ, and know that they're heading for destruction without Jesus. Uh, like I said, it's their choice whether or not they surrender to him, but it's our duty as Christians to make sure that they've at least heard about it so they can have that choice to make. And we read this verse every week, and we'll read it again later. At the end of every message, you know, Romans 10, 13, it says that whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But uh, we don't ever go on and read the next verse. Whoever does call upon the Lord, the Lord will be saved. But if we read the next verse, it says, how can they call on him to be saved? Unless they believe in him. And how can they believe in him <coughs> if they've never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless somebody tells them? Uh, you know, I've heard people say, I think that's up to the preachers to tell people about Jesus. If you're born again, believer in Jesus Christ, you are a preacher. Just like Josh said a couple of weeks ago. You know, once you get saved, that qualifies you to tell somebody else how you did that. So once you're saved, you are a preacher. And uh, I think a lot of times... We don't want to share Jesus with them. That's too awkward. We want to water down the gospel, and we'll say something like, hey, you should, you should go to church. You know, that's easy to say, but that's not the gospel. The gospel is <clears throat> the blunt truth that we're all heading for destruction, and Jesus Christ came to save us. It was a rescue mission for the whole world. <clears throat> and uh, we don't have to go there. I've heard a lot of preachers preach about the gospel, and it sounds like bad news. You know, that all they can talk about is hellfire and brimstone and God's wrath. and God's, I, That scares people to death. That scares people away from God. You know, the gospel is not bad news. It's good news. God wants us to enjoy life. We're supposed to shine our light so that others will believe in God. We're supposed to share the love of God. You know, people act like if you come to God, there's no more joy in life. But uh, Psalm 84, verse 11, we've read it before in here. You know, it says, God, don't withhold any good thing from those who do what is right. God is our son. He's our shield. He gives us grace and glory. There's nothing bad about that. God wants us to enjoy life. The gospel isn't that we're doomed. The gospel is that through Christ we can be saved. It's a positive thing. It's not a, a negative thing. You know, the most popular verse in the world is John 3.16. It says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's the gospel. You know, people are headed for destruction without Christ, and they do need to know that. But we need to tell it to them in a positive way in a loving way, in a way that will draw them in instead of scaring them to death to where they'll never go to church again. Uh, you know, it says in Ephesians that we're all walking dead men and women without Christ. And that is the truth of the gospel. And we should be telling people that instead of just, you know, casually saying, like I said, are you coming to church? You know, most people, the reason they don't come to church is because they don't take it seriously. The only life they know about is the life they live day to day. They don't realize how important it is. It really is about life and death. And not just life and death here, but life and death in eternity. And uh, a lot of people don't know that. You know, we think everybody on the planet knows about Jesus. You know, when I was going into jail to minister, it amazed me how many people, especially young people in the jail, had never even heard about Jesus. We just take it 
<clears throat> for granted that everybody knows the gospel. Everybody knows that Jesus came and died for us. But the reality is a lot of people don't. They don't know they have a choice. And they don't know they're on their way to, their way to hell without Jesus. They don't know anything about God. All they know is what this world has done to them in their day-to-day -day life. And they don't know it because we haven't told them about it. You know, and uh, even when we do invite them to church, a lot of times we focus on what Jesus can help you with your habits or Jesus can help you with things in this life. And he can and he will, but that's not why he came. You know, he came to save us from eternal separation from God. He came to save us from hell, and he came to save us from destruction. You know, he will help you with all of life's problems, but he's more concerned about your soul than he is with your habits. And, uh, you know, once you've truly surrendered your life to Jesus, the Holy Spirit will get rid of your habits. That'll, that'll just naturally go away after you're born again and receive the Holy Spirit. I've experienced that in my own life. Things that I tried to get rid of, fighting tooth and nail for years trying to overcome, there was no way to overcome it. But once I surrendered to Christ, the Holy Spirit just, you know, I didn't have those desires anymore. And uh, once you get there, you won't be bound by those things anymore. Uh, Proverbs 24, verses 11 and 12. This is talking about sharing the gospel. It says, rescue those who are unjustly sentenced to die. Save them as they stagger to their death. Don't excuse yourself by saying, look, we didn't know. For God understands all hearts, and he sees you. And he who guards your soul knows you knew. He will repay all people as their actions deserve. Uh, you know, those are pretty serious verses. That says if we know somebody's lost, then we have a duty to tell them about the gospel, whether they receive it or not, you know, that's up to them. But if God lays it on your heart to share the truth of the gospel, that without Jesus, you're headed for destruction and we don't do it, then that falls on us, is what that verse is saying. And, uh, you know, just like they had that great heap of stones to remember Achan and his family, you know, we drive by them all the time. There's cemeteries everywhere. You know, we've got headstones to remind us whether or not we shared the gospel with somebody. And if you've never been there, that is a horrible feeling to stand at somebody's headstone and realize you never shared the gospel with them. <clears throat> that is a, a really bad feeling. I've been there. I mean, that was before I gave my life to Christ. But I can remember standing at a lot of grave sites, just wondering, hoping that that person knew Jesus before they died. And I'll never know until I get to heaven. Uh, I try to make it a point that everybody I do know, I find out about their salvation. And, you know, make sure they know Christ. Whether they accept him or not, I want to share him with them so that if they do die, you know, I don't feel guilty about not asking them about their relationship with Christ. And I think that's very important. You know, a lot of us are uncomfortable sharing with people we don't know. But I think a lot of us, too, are uncomfortable sharing with people that we do know. You know, I've got a lot of family. And uh, sometimes it's awkward for us to bring that up and try to try to share Jesus with somebody. You know, most of us think inviting somebody to church is the gospel. But it's not. That's a way of avoiding the gospel. You know, just saying, hey, you want to go to church? That's easy to do. But to actually look somebody in the eye and ask them, have you trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord? For some reason, that's hard for us. And uh, I think the reason that's hard is because it's a spiritual battle. You know, when it comes to that point where you're sitting there thinking about it, and you know God's telling you to do it, you know, that's Satan putting fear in your heart. That don't come from God. It's Satan that puts those thoughts in your head of all the reasons that you shouldn't 
share the gospel with somebody and just ask him that one simple question. You know, do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord? Have you ever surrendered your life to him? And uh, that's a, a simple question, and it's easy to ask. But I think we run away from it a lot of time, and we try to, like I said, just pawn it off as a simple question. Is It's a whole lot easier to say, do you want to go to church, than it is to point blank ask somebody, do you know Jesus? But uh, those thoughts are not from God. You know, if God puts it on your heart to share the gospel with somebody, do it. And whether they reject it or not, you know, if they do reject it, that takes 30 seconds. You can be like, okay, just wanted to run that by you. But if they do receive it, then that could go into an hour-long conversation about the Lord. And that's a good thing. And uh, then you can have that in your heart, that I've led somebody to Christ. You know, like I said, the gospel ain't, it's not us inviting somebody to church. He commands us to find out whether or not they know about Jesus. Then we can invite them to church. Uh, the Bible says we can help them become a disciple, a disciple, a follower of Jesus, but it doesn't do any good to just bring a lost person to church. They'd just be going to church if they don't hear anything about Christ, if, they, if they're never confronted with that you know have you ever surrendered your life to christ we have to get them to jesus and i'm not saying don't invite people to church by all means invite people to church because this might be where they meet jesus i'm just saying i think we need to ask them about their relationship with the lord before we even get that far as inviting somebody to church ask them about jesus first you know that's what we're called to do uh, and it is that important. Jesus himself said in John chapter 8 and verse 24, <clears throat> he said, that is why I said that you will die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am who I claim to be, you will die in your sins. Coming to church don't save us. Surrendering our will to God and making Jesus Christ our Lord is the only way that we're saved. And I believe churches all over the world are just full of people that are going to die in their sins because they've never surrendered their will and their hearts to Jesus and made him Lord. You know, like I keep saying, church don't save you. Jesus Christ does. Uh, Jesus talks about that. Uh, like I said, I believe all over the world people are going to church and they're not saved. They think they're fine because they're going to church. And uh, the problem is... The pastors, the church people, nobody's asking them, are you saved? They just are assuming people are because they're at church. And Jesus is talking about that in Matthew 7, verses 21 through 23. There's a difference in believing and being saved. I mean, a lot of people believe, and that's what this is talking about. It says, not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works? Those people believe, you know, it's the power of the name of Jesus that cast out devils and done many wonderful works. Just because we believe in Jesus don't mean that we have surrendered our own will to him. I don't mean he's my Lord. And in verse 23, it says, And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. You know, people can go to church their entire life and never be surrendered to Christ as Lord. Uh, you know, maybe that's you. I don't know. I tell you all the time, the only one knows your relationship with God is you and him. You know, maybe the Holy Spirit's talking to you right now. Maybe you've been in church your whole life, but you've never really humbled yourself and made Jesus Lord. And when I say Lord, I mean, are you being obedient to him? That's what that means. You know, if he's Lord, then I'm going to do what he says. I'm going to do what his word says. And, uh, you know, when we come to the end of our lives, like I said, only you and God know that. But when we stand before him, it's too late then 
to accept him as Lord. It's too late then to make the changes. We were talking about that last night in the uh, uh, Celebrate Restoration. You know, whether you're in church or you're still on the street, lost. Uh, either way, lost is lost. It don't matter where you are. And without Christ, you've got the same destruction to look forward to as Achan and his family. Uh, like Pastor Chris was sharing in his sermon on Sunday, we have no idea when this life will end. If you weren't here Sunday, he did a, a really neat demonstration. He had a real long rope, and uh, at some point on the rope, he put a little piece of red tape on it. And he said, you know, that rope was supposed to be eternity, and this little portion of it was our life. And we cram everything into that one little space, and we never think about eternity. You know, if that's all we think about is how we're going to please ourselves while we're here, how we're going to look to other people while we're here, uh, how much money we can make while we're here, and we don't put any effort into getting to know our Lord and Savior, you know, one day we will stand before Him. And uh, if we don't know Him as Lord, that day will be too late. Uh, we have to make that decision of why we're here, while we're here. And uh, like I said, we don't know when that day is going to be. Uh, that might be today for some of us. It may be 20, 30, 40, 50 more years for some of us. Uh, Travis's brother just had a, a heart attack the other day, and uh, he's not that old. So we don't know. We're not promised tomorrow. James says our life is but a vapor. And... Uh, we need to think about all of our loved ones. Their life is but a vapor. And we need to be concerned about whether or not they know the Lord. But, like I keep saying, without Christ, we're all headed for destruction. And just like all of Israel had to pick up a stone and throw it at Achan and his family, if we know that somebody's lost and we don't tell them the truth about the gospel, we might as well pick up a stone ourselves. We know that they're headed for destruction, and they need a way out of it. And if we've got the way out, we need to let them know about it. And uh, I think that there's a lot more going on, of that going on, than we would like to admit. You know, it may be people you work with that you just maybe don't like. Or if you're like me, I've got family members I had not seen probably in 30 years, and uh but it's my responsibility. I ought to be looking them up and uh, finding out, hey, do you know the Lord? That's our responsibility, like we just read in Proverbs a while ago. If we know about it and we don't do anything about it, then that falls on us. And uh, we shared this verse last night, too, in uh, Celebrate Restoration in Luke chapter 6 and verse 46. It says, so why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord? when you don't do what I say. And that, you know, it gets me thinking, can we even call him Lord ourselves if we're not doing the main thing he called us to do? You know, the great commission, the great command from Jesus was to go into all the earth and share the gospel and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And uh, are we doing that? Are we sharing our faith like we're supposed to be? You know, I don't want to hear depart from me, I never knew you. And I don't want you guys to hear it either. You know, I love you guys. That's why I preach these hard messages. It's not easy to get up here and preach these messages. But, you know, just patting somebody on the back and telling them everything's going to be okay, that don't save anybody's soul. That don't get anybody to God. Because the truth is, if they don't know Jesus, it's not going to be okay. They're heading for destruction. And we know they are. And uh, instead of just patting them on the back and saying, hey, everything's going to be all right, tell them the truth. Everything will be all right through Christ. That's what the Bible says. But without him, it's not going to be all right. Uh, and that's what we need to be sharing with people. But, uh, you know, we can't just make him our Savior. We have to make him our Lord and actually obey him and do what he says. And what he says is share the gospel, the truth about the gospel. Not about come to Christ and everything's going to be great, but it'll save your soul 
from eternal damnation. We'll still have trials and tribulations in life, but God will help you through them. God's people will help you through them. Uh, I love the way this church is. we got people hurting right now, but we've also got people willing to jump in and help. You know, you can't be a hurting person in this church without a whole group of people jumping in to make sure you got all the help you need. And that's what the, the body of Christ is for. But uh, I know that's probably the shortest message I've ever gave in here on a Wednesday night. But that's all God laid on, laid on my heart. So I'm not going to just stand up here and keep talking to fill up time. When God says, that's it, that's it. You know, I'll shut it down. But if you're watching online, if you're here, and that's you, you've never have given your Lord, uh, given your heart to Jesus and ask him to be your Lord, then we end every message like this. You know, now you can. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. If you're not sure whether you're saved or not, you can be saved right now. And it's as simple as saying, I need you, Lord. I need a Savior. I need help. And uh, tell God that. And tell him, I believe you died for my sins. I believe you died on the cross. And that you rose again the third day. And you're sitting on the right hand of the Father. And if you believe that in your heart, the Bible says you will be saved. And it says to confess it with your mouth unto salvation. And I'll read you those verses. In Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, it says that if you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So if you've done that, and I always like to say, you don't have to be at church to get saved. You can get saved right there on your couch if you're watching from home or if you're driving, listening to this on a podcast later or whatever. Anywhere you are, you call out to the Lord and he'll meet you right there. But it's important to confess that to somebody and uh, let them know I gave my life to Jesus as Lord. And uh, from that point on, just be obedient to him. And he'll be your Lord, and the Holy Spirit will guide you. And I always like to share these two verses with you, too. We already read the one, you know, whosoever shall call upon the Lord shall be saved. That's Romans 10, 13. It don't matter what your past is. God's not concerned about your past. Like I said, He didn't. Jesus didn't come to, because of our habits or any of the bad things we've done. He, called, he came to save our souls from eternal death damnation so it don't matter about your past uh, if somebody told you you were too bad to be saved they're wrong and uh, Romans 5 8 proves that it says God commended his love towards us and that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us so if you've got people in your ear telling you you need to get everything straightened out before you can come to the Lord they're wrong you come as you are that's why Christ died, is because we, the Bible says we're all sinners. But once we come to him and surrender our life to him, he forgives our sins and wipes us clean from them. And uh, if we'll be obedient to him, he'll be our Lord. And we'll be his people. But that's all I've got for tonight. And I hope you made that decision tonight. If you have and you need some help, you don't know where to go from there, uh, you're more than willing to come here to church and talk to any of us, we'll be glad to walk you through it and get you connected, uh, get you plugged into some some things that will help you grow in your faith. But thank you all for coming out. I'm glad you're here, and uh, I hope that helps somebody because I, I know when I was a new Christian, I had a really hard time sharing my faith because, you know, Satan don't want us sharing our faith. He's going to put those thoughts in your head, and he's going to put the fear in your heart that somebody else will tell them, Somebody else will tell them, or they already know, and that just ain't the case. So I encourage you, if you're having a hard time sharing your faith, tell God about it. Pray about it. Tell somebody else about it. And uh, once you start doing it, it gets easier the more you do it. Every time you do it, it gets easier. So I hope that helps somebody. Thank you all for being here. Uh, I'll pray for us, and we will be dismissed. Father, thank you again for the message this week. I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to 
to just think about it, Lord, and uh, to keep it in our hearts and think about it this week. And uh, if we're not sharing our faith, God, the way the way that you want us to, as much as you want us to, I pray that you'd help us to bring it to you and ask you for the courage, Lord, or just to show us how to do it if we don't know how. And I know it'll bring glory to your name, Lord, and it'll draw us closer to you while we do it. Lord, we love you, and we just thank you for loving us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.